So we left off here with the rules of probability. So we were noticing that there were some, some facts that happen with probability that we can't avoid, which is that all probabilities must be between 0 and 1 inclusively, meaning it can be as low as 0, including 0, you can have a probability of 0, and all the way up to 1, and you can have the probability of 1. But it can't be anything greater than 1, and it cannot be less than 0. And the sum of all the probabilities in your sample space must equal 1. That's why when we were back here with the empirical rule example, it was a little bit nerve-wracking that it didn't add up to 1, but then we realized that that was due mainly to sampling, or excuse me, to rounding error. Okay, so then, now that we know that, what must an impossible event have a probability equal to? You can't say it doesn't have a probability. Everything's got a probability if it's a future event. But if it's impossible, that means that it has a probability of zero. And if it's a certain event, if it is for sure going to happen, it has a probability of one, 100%. So that would be one equal to 100%. Okay. Any unusual event will be less than 5%. We learned that back in chapter three probability of something with, that is unusual, it would be less than 5% probability. We learned that in section 3.2, by the way, along with the empirical rule. All right, then a probability model is a list, often in table form, but not always. You can have them as equations or functions, and we'll see those a little bit later in chapter 7. Um, but a probability model is a list of all the possible outcomes of a probability experiment and each outcome's probability. So we will do this in table, we will also do them in graphs in chapter 7, um, and even in formulas a little bit in chapter 6 and chapter 7. So let's see here, we're going to determine the whether the following are valid probability models and explain. So in order to be a valid probability model, you have to abide by these two rules, which means that the probability of every event has got to be between 0 and 1, nothing bigger than nothing bigger than 1, nothing smaller than 0. And the sum of all the probabilities in the sample space must equal 1. So let's look here. We have negative 2, 0, 2, and 15. And the probabilities are 0 0.5, 0 0.1, 0 0.05, and 0 0.35. So every probability there is between 0 and 1, so that's good. Now we need to check that the sum is what we want it to be, 0 0.5 plus... 0 0.1, sure enough, it makes 1. OK, so let's explain why these are valid. I've got to type that up one second. So there we have it. Every probability is between 0 and 1, and the sum of these probabilities is 1. Now let's check this one over here. So we have every probability between 0 and 1 again, so that's good. But if we take 0.3 plus 0.4, uh, we get 1.1. So this is not a valid probability distribution for this one. Whereas this one is a valid probability distribution. All right, we're done with that. I'll underline these just so it's clear that's the answer. And then we have the explanation for it and everything. Good. Now, the following are both valid probability models for the genders of two children. Explain. Well, they're basically the same model. They're just kind of looking at it a different way. So one of them has it so, oops, sorry. One of them has it so that the genders are split up. So you're looking at the gender assignment of each child. Hold on, let me insert a row below here. And the other one has it so that you're looking at the number of girls, but you're still talking about two children in the family, right? So let me highlight these for you just a little bit. So if I say male, 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 female, female, male, there, I've sort of color coded it for you. So male, males here and the yellow ones, that would be no girls. So that's right here with the yellow one here. And then the two orange ones, male, female, and female, male, get put together right there with the one girl, 0.5. And then the female, female is 0.25. That's two girls. That's 0.25. So the probability on the model, or it's me on the left, considers each individual outcome, whereas the one on the right considers the number of girls, right? So the one on the left is kind of splitting them up, so you're looking at each of the genders individually, whereas the one on the right kind of groups them together, and you're only considering the number of males or the number of girls. 
those are both valid ways of looking at having two children. It's just kind of which way do we want to think about it. So keep in mind, this means that sometimes there is more than one probability model, depending on what's being recorded or considered. So sometimes we want to add up dice, and sometimes we just want to see what the numbers were. Right? So if you were tossing two dice, sometimes you want to sum them up, and sometimes you don't. So it just depends on what you're looking at. All right, so let's move on to a tree diagram. Now, a tree diagram is a graphic organizer that we use to kind of help us figure out the, the list of all the possibilities for our, a sequence of events. The thing about classical probability is that it's often very tricky to figure out all the possibilities. And a tree diagram is one way to help us organize that and just deduce that we have every outcome possible in our sample space. So for example, I have here a tree diagram for tossing of a single coin. So when you toss the coin, here you are at the beginning, you haven't tossed the coin yet. And then you toss it, there are two possible outcomes. There's this branch that leads to heads, or there's this branch that leads to tails. You either had one or the other. Those are the two outcomes. And as you move to the right along this graph, you're moving forward in time, right? So time goes from left to right in the diagram. So you have to have a starting point right here, and you branch off into two different directions. And then you want to make a vertical list on the right of all the outcomes. So heads, tails. So let's look at the two children example again. Suppose we want to imagine having those two children. How would that look like in a tree diagram? Well, it's funny you should ask. Let me type it up one second. Here it is. So we have here the first child. That's the green one. So you have your first child. You have a choice. You could either branch off towards male or branch off towards female. But you have to make this kind of V shape, sideways V shape. So you're moving along time, there's your first child. And then the blue section is your second child. So you could have had a second child be male, and that would give you male, male. Or you could have had your second child be female, or your second child be male, but your first child was female, or female, female. And in organizing yourself this way, you've assured yourself of finding the entire sample space, which is male, 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 female, female, male, and female, female. Those are the four options. And this portion over here is the actual sample space. You gotta make sure that you write that. This over on the left is just the way of organizing that so that you can come up with this list. Of course, this list is pretty simple, but a tree diagram is an idea that would help you even with more complicated ones. All right, what is the assumed probability? Well, we assume that boy and girl were equally likely pretty safe assumption most of the time. And if that's the case, then every probability has a one in four chance because they were all just as likely as everything else. So one fourth, right? Because we assumed male, female, all of that's the same. All right, then what's the event of having at least one boy, at least one boy? So that's either one boy or two boys. So that would be male, female, that's having at least one boy, female, male, and male, male. So I either have one boy, one boy, or two boys. That's at least one boy. So means one or more males. So there's our result. It's a little bit strange English-wise, but the word at least actually means you have that much or more. It's the equivalent of greater than or equal to. So I want greater than or equal to one boy, so I want one or more boys. Sorry, that's bothering me. All right, what about if that, excuse me, is that event a simple event? You know what, let me make a note real quick here. Note, at least means greater than or equal to, just for future reference. All right, now is this event simple? Well, that's a definition from way back a few pages ago, but simple means that it has only one possibility, and that is not the case here. So there are three outcomes here, not just one. All right, 
So the tree diagram above worked well for two children. Yes, it did. I don't know what I was getting at there. One second. Actually, let me add in what is the probability of f first, and then I'll finish this question out. So I had no question in there. So the probability of f would be probability of f would be equal to, well, there are three outcomes in the sample space, so three out of four, which would be 0 0.75 or 75%, either way you like to write it. All right, so we're done with that right there. So now we'll finish out this question, which is the tree diagram worked well for two children, but would you want to do it for six children? And the answer to that is big fat no. Nobody wants to do that for six children. So no. The diagram would be so large, it would be difficult to fit on the paper. So we'll need another way to tackle probabilities. For larger sample spaces. Okay. So a t-diagram is great, but it only works for a relatively small sample space. In this case, the sample space was four. It'll work for four, eight, sixteen or so, but two to the sixth is quite large. It's 64 and you don't want to make a tree diagram that has 64 branches in it you drive yourself crazy that way so we need another way to tackle classical probability when it's bigger than that so a tree diagram is good for small stuff for small sample spaces but we'll use the multiplication rule which is coming in the next page for larger which we'll learn, well actually we'll learn the multiplication rule a little bit now and we'll also learn it in section 5.3 as well. All right, so let's look at that real quick at the beginning of this. So we're going to start off with the multiplication rule of counting to determine the size of your sample space. So for example, I just said 64 back page when I was talking about six children. Where did I get that from? So if you're going to have one event occur, can occur in m ways, and a second event can occur in n ways, then the number of ways the two events can occur together in sequence is m times n. Sequence meaning one following the other. So this rule will help us find the sample space, or the size of the sample space, um, and also the size of our tree diagram we would make for classical probabilities. So for example, let's say you're going to toss a coin, a fair coin, three times. Well, each time you toss it, you have two outcomes. So that would give you 2 times 2 times 2, which is 8 possible outcomes. So if you're going to make a tree diagram, it would have 8 total branches at the end. All right, what about tossing a fair 6-sided die and then a fair 20-sided die? Well, the 6-sided die has 6 sides, and the 20-sided die, yes, they do exist, has 20 sides, which means that 6 times 20, which is 120 possible outcomes. All right, what about you're going to select a card from a poker deck, a standard poker deck, and those have 52 cards. You're expected to know that. And then you're going to shuffle it and draw again. Well, that would be 52 cards for the first choice times 52 cards for the second choice, and that would give you 2,704 choices total. All right, what about Yahtzee? In Yahtzee, the game Yahtzee, you roll a six-sided die, five, oh, actually five six-sided dice. So the first die has six options, the second die has six options, and so on. So that would give you seven, 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 six total options for the sample space. Just on a side note right here, if you didn't return, if, if the first card was not returned, that would be 52 cards for the first option and then 51 for the second option, right? Because if you don't put back the first card, then you only have 51 cards left in the deck, which would be two, six, five, two options. It's a little bit less because you, you did not replace that first card. Okay, we're all done with this section and I'll see you back here with the next page.